It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the afternoon sessions, um, uh, H.A. Nethery uh, from Florida Southern College will be giving a talk on uh, Yancey, Husserl, and racism at the level of passive synthesis. Thank you. All right, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you today. I'd like to thank uh, Deborah and Gina for coordinating all of this. It's awesome. Uh, just a couple things before I start my talk, a kind of little spiel I give anytime we're going to talk about race or racism. There's a couple things I want to say. One, I'm going to be talking a lot about white people. In fact, that's exclusively who I'll be talking about. You need to know that I include myself in the scope of white people. Okay, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is that when I'm talking about racism, I'm talking about a very specific strand of racism. And specifically, that's North American anti-black racism. That's what I'm shooting for, for the most part. And then finally, whenever uh, I give a talk that has anything to do with racism or if even the idea of privilege is gonna come up in it, I just quickly say this. When people talk about white privilege and critical theories of race and things like this, this is not meant to make you feel guilty by any means. It's to make you feel angry so that you try to change the situation, okay? So if you could keep those things in mind as, I, as we go along, I think we'll be fine. So it is well known that phenomenology plays a major role within the side of critical race theory that focuses on the density of lived experience, primarily in the form of the white gaze and the creation of double consciousness. Though the former uh, term was coined by George Yancey, one can find it throughout the uh, history of critical race theory. From Sojourner's Truth's experience of not being seen as a woman due to the color of her skin, to W.B. Du Bois's experience of developing double consciousness in relation to the look of his white female classmate, to Fanon's discussion of the young white girl on his train yelling, look, a Negro, and the splintering of his world under her eye, to the concept of bad faith in the existential work of Lewis Gordon, and perhaps its culmination in the work of George Yancey. In one way or another, these philosophers use phenomenology to describe the way in which their identities are always already constituted as delinquent within the consciousness of white people prior to any active reflection, and how their own identity fractures in relation to this white gaze, a fracturing that creates unspeakable ontological and ultimately physical violence. That is, the very perception of, of black or brown skin is already the perception of some kind of delinquency, whether criminal, sexual, economic, etc., for the white gaze. And this is only one phenomenological strain of thought that runs through critical race theory. One need only, uh, need only to look at the work of Aliyah al-Saji or Emily Lee to find uh, other variations. Though these philosophers are already doing phenomenology in their work, there is a deeper level of analysis that has yet to be given. Specifically, an account has not been yet provided as regards the production of the white gaze within the consciousness of us white folks. That is, how is an already racialized world of experience produced prior to any active reflection? It seems to me that this is an important question to ask and an important question to investigate, since quote unquote good whites, as Yancey would say, see themselves as not racist due simply to the absence of any explicit prejudice or bigotry. Yet, as Yancey would argue, even a progressive or liberal white person will still exhibit deeply embodied responses to the presence of a body of color. How does this happen? In the presentation that follows, I will argue that Husserl's accounts of internal time consciousness and passive synthesis can show how a racialized world is constituted within the consciousness of white folks. I begin by setting the stage using Yancey's famous elevator example in which a white woman perceives Yancey as already delinquent due to the color of his skin. With this example under our belt, I then turn to Husserl's accounts of internal time consciousness and passive synthesis. And finally, I end the essay by reading Yancey's elevator example back through the work done in the previous two sections. So first section. In his text, Black Bodies, White Gazes, both first and second editions, George Yancey argues that systematic and structural racism inculcates within white people what he calls the white gaze, or a kind of socioeconomic aperture in which the identity of a person of color is taken from them, molded into something monstrous within the white imaginary, and subsequently returned to the person of color in a monstrous, monstrous form, i.e. delinquent. This return, Yancey argues, fractures the identity of people of color, giving them a kind of ontological fracturing or double consciousness, as Du Bois termed it. That is, people of color in the United States are forced to exist with an, ir with an irreconcilable double sense of themselves how they understand themselves, and how white people understand them. As Yancey says, he is, quote, an essence, that is blackness, well before 
his existence. Yancey's most famous articulation of the white gaze is through his elevator example. Yancey, dressed in a suit and tie, enters an elevator, quote, where a white woman waits for the floor, end quote. He continues, she sees my black body, though not the same one I have seen reflected to me from the mirror on any number of occasions. Buying into the myth that one's dress says something about the person, one might think that the markers of my dress, suit and tie, should ease her tension. What is it that makes the markers of my dress inoperative? She sees a black male body supersaturated with meaning. Her body language signifies, look, the black. On this score, though short of a performative locution, her body language functions as an insult and she clutches her purse. So what happens here? Yancey enters an elevator, well-dressed, and the white woman inside clutches her purse instantly. This is a moment of what Yancey calls the white bodily repertoire. When a white body portrays an internal, or as I call it, a passive racism. The white woman might not have any explicitly racist beliefs or prejudices, but there is still a passive form of racism that is belied through the clutching of her purse. This is the same bodily, white bodily repertoire that functions when a white body locks the car door when a black body is in proximity. In this sense, when the woman sees Yancey and uh, clutches her purse, the white gaze is operational. Yancey's body is immediately constituted within her perception and thus appears to her as necessarily delinquent. The other side of this is, of course, the effect on Yancey. His identity is, mis is fissured in the sense that her gaze returns to him a monstrous version of himself. In any case, what we should notice in this example is that Yancey's body immediately signifies to her a sense of danger, and this sense of danger is embodied by his black skin. As Yancey enters the elevator, the white woman does not undergo a process that might take the form of, oh, here is a body. It's the body of a person. The body of this person is well-dressed. Uh-oh, the body of this well-dressed person is black, so now I should be scared. No, this simply does not happen, nor does it happen when the car door is locked when a black male body walks by. Instead, the presence of the black body is processed by her consciousness before she is ever aware, and her hands tighten their grip on her purse. That is, the body she experiences is immediately attached to a horizon of possible actions before the woman ever has a chance to reflect on it. This is what I mean by passive or implicit racism. One does not need to have a set of explicitly racist beliefs to participate in passive racism. Instead, that form of racism is belied through our own white bodily repertoire. And remember, when I'm speaking, I'm including myself in this. I have locked the door. Ultimately, it seems to me that white experience in this country is racialized. A form of uh, delinquency is pre-given as Yancey enters the elevator, and any action he takes will be experienced by the woman through the lens of that form. Phenomenologically, this means that she experiences Yancey as having a horizon of possible actions attached to him, things that he might or might not do, which is given through the form of delinquency. Any action he takes will be a delinquent action. If he smiles, he will be a predator. If he does not smile, he will be a predator. If he adjusts his jacket, then he might be reaching for a weapon or moving to strike. And if he doesn't move at all, then he might just be biding his time. Ultimately, the white gaze consists of a racialized field of experience saturated with bodily embedded responses, the clutching of one's purse, the locking of one's door. As such, to say that the white woman's experience is immediately raced is to say that Yancey is pre-given to her as already delinquent. And though she may not hold any explicitly racist beliefs, a level of passive racism is still belied through the unconscious bodily movements. Let us now look at a phenomenological description of how this racialization occurs. Section two, apperception, time consciousness, and association. Overall, my position is that the racing of experience can be explained through Husserl's notion of apperception. So in this section, I would like us to work through the idea along with uh, the notions of far uh, retention and protension and association. Within any act of, of perception, we perceive things that we might call present, but we also experience things that are not themselves directly given within perception. What does this mean? Think about the act of seeing an object or person of your affection. When I see my partner walk through the door in the evening, I'm experiencing both presence and absence simultaneously. In terms of presence, when she walks through the door, I directly perceive a body. The body is present to me. However, I also immediately perceive this body as my partner and further as loved. These additions, my partner, loved, uh, to the perception of my partner are not present in the same way that her body is. I can point at a body, but I cannot point at loved. As such, the values themselves are absent from perception. They are added to me by the, they are added by me to the body that I perceive. 
In turn, a racialized field of experience is a field saturated with apperceptions attached to the appearance of bodies of color. And again, it is the experience of presence and absence. A body of color is, is present and I apperceive a form of delinquency which is itself absent. Just as I apperceive my partner immediately as loved, the white woman in Yancey's elevator example apperceives Yancey immediately as a threat. Using Husserl's terminology, the perception of the values that accrue to the body of my partner are apperceptions. Here is Husserl's definition. I quote, Apperceptions are intentional lived experiences that are conscious of something as perceived, but this something as perceived is not self-given in these lived experiences, not completely. And they are called apperceptions to the extent that they have this trait, end quote. Here we find Husserl directly defining the notion of apperception as a kind of intentionality within which consciousness intends meaning within a perception that are not, strictly speaking, directly given. Furthermore, Husserl goes to great lengths in a number of texts to describe apperception as intertwined or verfluchten within the experience of a present body as such. It is not that we see the body and add a layer of meaning on top of it. Rather, the apperceived meaning is intertwined with the perceived as such. We experience them both together simultaneously. Since apperception is the association of meaning latent within consciousness with a, with a current appearance, we should first ask, what does it mean for a meaning to be latent within consciousness? To understand this, we, I think we need to look to uh, Husserl's theory of internal time consciousness. And let me just, a lot of you I'm sure are very familiar with this. Let me just give you a brief little review, a sketch of how this works, and I'll use Husserl's famous examples. So in order to enter into the complexities of Husserl's analyses on internal time consciousness, it would be first to engage in a brief sketch of the overall theory. Let us use Husserl's favorite example, a tone played on a violin. I hear a violin tone, I hear the tone begin, and as it plays, I perceive the tone as, ex as extending through time, and when it ends, I can recall experiencing an entire tone. That I perceive the tone as extended through time is due to the activity of consciousness. The current moment of the tone that I'm hearing is connected with the moments of the tone that have just passed, and furthermore, as I listen to the tone, I expect the tone to keep going or to stop, signaling its end. Now I listen to a melody rather than a single tone. I hear the melody begin, and as I perceive the different tones, they are all connected with the tones that have passed, such that I have the experience of a continual melody and a melody that builds up over time. That is, the perception of a melody is intimately involved with the retention of the tones that have passed and the expectation or protension of the tones that I expect to come. Or to use a final example, I am listening to someone speak. This person tells me Husserl is a phenomenologist. For me to experience this as a whole statement after the speaker finishes the sentence is due, again, to the structure of time consciousness. Each guttural sound that I hear is connected to sounds that have just passed and to sounds that are not yet, sounds that I expect to hear. In the case of each example, without the functioning of internal time consciousness, we as humans would only ever have experiences of a now with no connection to the past or to the future. This is what Dr. Rodemeyer sometimes calls instant amnesia. We could only experience a series of frames with no links between them such that we could even call them a series of frames. Or without internal time consciousness, each letter that is read in a text would only ever be that letter and words would never form, nor would I be able to identify each letter as I see them since this would require the comparison of the current perception with others that have passed. In Husserl's terms, these experiences that have just passed but are still connected to the now are held on through, onto through the form of retention. Finally, the experiences that we expect but have not yet come are given through the form of protension. As to the present moment or the now moment, this will have a handful of names throughout Husserl's career, but he often refers to it as a primordial impression. We're just gonna focus on two for just a second, retention and protension. So in that little introductory sketch that I gave on Husserl's theory of time, I've already introduced you to the idea of retention, but we're gonna talk about it just a little bit more. So what is retention? The holding onto of a past impression and its connection with a present impression. It is now our task to go much deeper into this form of intentionality though, as it is through retention that past meanings are held onto in such a way that they can silently and implicitly motivate how we experience the world, specifically a racialized world. So thanks to Dr. Rodemeyer, a distinction can be made uh, when we talk about, about retention between near and far retention. These terms can be brief briefly described as follows. Near retention is the activity of retention that we were examining under the generic name of retention up until now. That is the holding of past primordial impressions in terms of an immediate experience. 
My words to you fall into near retention as I speak them, and you hold on to them such that you can make sense of what I'm saying. Far retention, on the other hand, is a system of the retentions of retentions that are passively present within consciousness. For Husserl, as retentional experiences consisting of retentions and protentions fade into far retention, they become sedimented, and thus a part of how we experience the world. As they fade into far retention, these experiences lose their content to us and end up becoming a kind, a, a kind of type or general form for future experience. Husserl writes, quote, everything that consciousness undergoes through, undergoes through changes and transformations, even after the transformations, remains sedimented in it as its history, end quote. So experiences fade into far retention and become sedimented. What is this sedimentation? Husserl directly refers to sedimentation as the subsoil of memory. Quote, memories emerge as awakenings of components of the subsoil of memory. The latter contains ordered sedimentations layered in a fixed order of all particular retentions of all presence that have been constituted. From these two small passages cited above, we can see that sedimentation has to do with a kind of layering within far retention. We find another clue when Husserl writes that, uh, he, I'm quoting this, it's the distant sphere of far retentions contains, quote, sedimentations of all previous accomplishments of previous living presence. That is, our past experience fades into the system of far retention, and they do so in terms of kind of a layering, hence the metaphor of sedimentation. Let us use an example to illustrate far retention. Imagine a fly enters my office. All of my past encounters with flies and their attempts to land on various items that I am either eating or drinking are sedimented in the system of far retention as a kind of general type of experience. This general type is then awakened upon seeing the fly enter the room. I am instantly annoyed when I see the fly. Rather than wondering what an insect of that type might do, because a general type of experience within far retention has been awakened and I am now expecting the fly to attempt to land, say, in my coffee. This general type of experience is passively present in the sense that it is not active within my current horizon of experience. I am not expecting to see a fly. Rather, one enters my field of vision. However, even though it is not active, this general type is not completely absent. Instead, it is latent, such that should a fly enter my field of vision, I can expect it to fly towards whatever edible item is in my possession. In this sense, we can think of far retention, the system of the retentions of retentions, as a distant horizon that is latent but passively present within experience. I argue that there is a racialized sedimentation within the far retention of us white folks in North America, and that this is itself the product of what Yancey calls the racist white imaginary, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But briefly, this imaginary is a kind of well that we draw upon in order to think the black body. And this well consists of the repetition of both the presence and absence of black bodies, or of bodies of color in all forms of media. Bodies of color are almost always associated with some form of delinquency if, and this is the important part, if they are represented at all. And insofar as past experiences are springboards for future possible experiences, to use a little bit of Merleau-Pontian language, a system of sedimented representations of bodies of color is, necessary delinqu is necessarily delinquent will motivate further perceptions of this supposed delinquency. In other words, as a white person, is, it, is not, it is not my repeated interactions with people of color that forms these layers of sedimentations, but instead my experiences with representations of people of color and how white folks speak and do not speak of them. The repetition of these representations form a kind of general type in my stream of far retention, my system of far retention, which then becomes acti activated in the presence of a body of color. So to move on to protension. Again, we have already briefly looked at protension, but let us look at it now in more detail. In describing the experience of a tone, Husserl writes, quote, a continual intention reaches into the future. The actually present portion of the duration again and again adds a new now, and a protension adds, adheres to the tone constituting appearances. A protension that is fulfilled is a protension aimed at this tone just as long as the tone endures, and that it is annulled and changes if something new begins in its place." End quote. Here, protension is connected with the addition of new tone constituting appearances. The protension is aimed at the tone appearances that are yet to come, and are fulfilled when these tones arrive, or are not fulfilled should the tone suddenly end, which is itself evidence for the activity of protension. For example, I am listening to a melody build over a duration, and as the melody begins to build upwards to a kind of tonal climax, it suddenly stops. 
I experience this sudden stop as a kind of rupture, as my protention of the continuation of the melody is suddenly unfulfilled with the possibility of fulfillment annulled. Using the distinction between near and far retention as a guide, we can lay out a similar distinction in protension as regards uh, temporalizing consciousness, though Husserl never made use of this term himself. This distinction between near and far retention is that in which the terms near and far are understood in a similar way to uh, the way that you're used with retention. Much like near retention, the concept of near protension has already been discussed at length under the generic term protension and denotes the activity of consciousness wherein future primordial impressions are anticipated as regards to the constitution of an imminent temporal object. And again, just as far retention constitutes a structure of past experience which is passively present within experience itself, far protention constitutes a kind of anticipated structure in the sense of a horizon of possibilities. Husserl writes, quote, just as a retentional horizon of the past is invariably connected to each impressional present, a protentional horizon of the future is no less invariably connected to an impressional present, end quote. Both of these activities of protention are partially responsible for the openness of consciousness as such, in that both my perception of a present object and the field of perception within which it occurs are a going beyond of consciousness in the sense of going beyond what is immediately given. Far protension has a parallel function with far retention, though with an essential difference. While far retention is a system of retentions of retentions in which the past experience, in which past experiences are held yet passively present, far protention is a system of openness to future experiences in the sense of projecting possible courses of action, both ours and others. While the content of far retention is of past retained experiences, protention does not strictly speak have content. Instead, far, far pro, protension protends future experiences as, as both one, the structure of openness to an extended present as such, and two, as the expectations of types of experiences or experiential objects that are yet to come, and thus outlines in advance a horizon of potential and possible experience. In the case of a racialized field of experience, the protentions that, uh, that concern us are those that activate the general types of racist experience outlined in the previous section. That is, when a body of color appears within my field of perception, the general type of racist experience within my far retention, which is the supposedly necessary connection between skin color and delinquency, is activated and then I expect this body of color to act in some kind of delinquent way. As such, I lock my car door when a young black man is walking down the street. The locking of the car door, like the clutching of the purse, is an act of the white gaze, my fear in the face of a black body. Association, last little step, then I'll close up. We have looked at apperception and the structure of internal time consciousness, which has supplied us with the ideas of uh, far and near re retention and protention. A present is constructed through holding on to past moments and the expectation of future moments. This can be further differentiated to the system of far retention that holds all of my past experiences as forms of possible experiences, and into the system of far protention that projects these possible forms of experience onto my experiential horizon. This, however, occurs through what Husserl terms association. In its most basic form, association consists of the bringing together of general types of experience held in far retention with our current present experience, based on a similarity between our present experience and a general type of experience held in far retention. This bringing together is understood in terms of a kind of awakening. Husserl, in a manuscript from 1924, writes that association is awakening, end quote. In another manuscript, he writes, quote, we will then find the similarity of something awakened with something that is immediately awakening as proper to immediate association, as proper to immediate awakening, end quote. So what are we to make of this awakened, and why is it intimately connected with the notion of apperception? Husserl describes awakening as, quote, the augmentation of vivacity. It sounds kind of Humean. The augmentation of vivacity, that is, of affectivity, end quote. If far retention holds general types of experience and association is the awakening of a past general type of experience based on a current experience, then we can see that awakening is supposed to denote the way in which a past general type of experience becomes present for us within a current experience. That is, this general type of experience becomes affective again precisely in its form as a general type of experience by providing an outline of possibilities on the horizon of far retention, which are themselves in accordance with this general type. As such, we then find far retention awakened within our present experience, exercising affective force in the form of future possibilities of experience. 
Indeed, Husserl writes, quote, we, are very, we see very quickly that the phenomenology of association is, so to speak, a higher continuation of the doctrine of original time consciousness. Through association, the constitutive accomplishment is extended to all levels of apperception, end quote. Here, Husserl is describing association as a higher continuation of the constitutive activities of temporalizing consciousness, since association propagates the constitutive accomplishment of temporalizing consciousness to all levels of apperception. Association extends the accomplishments of temporalizing consciousness to all levels of apperception because it is the passive bringing together of a, ret of a retention and a current experience. Thus, since apperception is the intention of meaning that is not itself present, and association is the process whereby past experiences are brought passively into present experience, we can easily see how it is that association propagates the const constituent activities of temporalizing consciousness to all levels of apperception. Final section, just about done. Let us now look at the, how the phenomenological language we just worked through can be applied to Yancey's elevator example. We will see that this phenomenolo phenomenological language shows us the development of the white gaze such that it retains the racist bodily repertoire analyzed by Yancey. As Yancey enters the elevator, he becomes the object of the white woman's intention in which her experience of him is already racialized. What is present to her is, is not a black body, is a black body, but she constitutes this black body as an object of terror or fright through the intertwining of an apperception within her experience. This apperception is one of violence or criminality. She experiences a black body and that this kind of body necessarily tends towards violence, which then functions as a lens through which she will interpret all of that body's somatic and linguistic performances. According to the scheme I have just laid out, the apperception occurs like this. The presentation of a black body to, white, to her consciousness awakens a sedimented image of the black body within her system of far retention. Again, the sedimented image is the result of the constant production within white culture of the fictitious relationship between black bodies and delinquency. The presentation of the black body awakens the sedimented, sedimented form of experience and associates it with the presence of that body as such, intertwining it within her experience. That is, the presentation of a body of color awakens the association. Through far protention, this connection is experienced as a horizon of possible actions that the black body might make such that any somatic or linguistic performance is interpreted through the lens of violence or delinquency. This horizon then points back to the system of far retention in which the white woman's learned response, the clutching of her purse, becomes a part of her racist bodily repertoire and thus automatic. This, of course, raises the question, where does this fictitious image of the black body come from? What is its origin? Well, the answer to that would be, I would just refer you to almost all of critical race theory. That's most of it. Um, you can look at George Yancey, Bell Hooks, Charles Mills, Franz Fanon, W.B. Du Bois, Catherine Gines, Emily Lee. You can look at a bunch of people for this. But I can briefly say the following for Yancey. For Yancey, there is a racist white imaginary an imago of the black body, which is promulgated and reified continuously within our country. For example, humans are not raced on the evening news unless they are persons of color wanted for or allegedly already guilty of a crime. The television show Cops, which has been running for over 30 years, overwhelmingly uses footage of white police officers arresting or searching for a person of color. Television cop dramas more often than not portray the perpetrator as a person of color. White bodies are constantly held up as the standard of aesthetic beauty through the repetition of only white bodies and faces in the media, and the list could go on. And of course, all of this has its historical origin within the desubjectification of the black body during the slave trade through the works of our, some of our favorite philosophers, Hobbes, Locke, Hume, Kant, Hegel, all helped to spread this. My point is this. As white folks, our experience is saturated with the idea that the black body is dangerous and ugly and that the white body is safe and beautiful and that this is false. This constant repetition ends up within far retention and acts as the springboard for further intentions. Lies and falsehoods in, violence and death out. In any case, all of this occurs passively within perception and it is only when we reflect upon it that it comes to our attention. As such, this is what we might call implicit or passive racism, something that nearly all of us white folks, myself very much included, take part in. We do not notice it, but it is there, a haunting presence that makes us nervous when a black body comes near and is belied through our bodily actions. Thank you.
Right. So thank you for that. We actually have until 3.20 as the schedule list here for Q&A, so quite a bit of time. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I think I'm overall convinced by your phenomenological account of the constitution of what you're calling passive racism. Um, but I'm more interested in where you want to take this. So I think in phenomenology, we often spend a lot of time giving these careful descriptive accounts. We want to understand what this experience is like and how this experience is constituted. But of course, with issues like what you're dealing with here, you also want to be able to undermine that process and replace those prejudices with something new. So do you think you can actually give a prescriptive account using this understanding that you've just offered us of how to overcome your own passive racism? Or is, you don't? No. I mean, one, it's such a thorny problem to begin with. How, okay, what do we do about racism? I mean, it's just a, a thorny problem to begin with. Um, in ter <laughs> it's a good question. I just don't know how to answer it. You know what I mean? Like, it's, so where am I going with this? Well, I was, this was part of a larger book project in which I tried to show the white gaze. But I've been working critical theories of race for a very long time now. And one thing that I realized that me as a white person writing another thing about racism wasn't super helpful, right? So this piece for me, I, I'm very much inspired, and you brought this up a little bit in the last thing, I very much believe that the reduction, I very much believe that the phenomenological method is a process of self-transformation. So the act of writing it and the act of reading it or hearing it should have some kind, not that I'm like the god of writing or anything, you know what I mean, I'm just not trying to be an asshole, but you know what I mean? Like, it should, there should be some kind of self-transformation that goes on. And it's, at, at, for the most part, what we're at is kind of a boiling point. Like, things need to rupture, pe things need to break, people need to see that these things are going on because our consciousness is so goddamn good at putting it under the covers. Well, just a quick follow-up. I think you're selling yourself short. Um, if you give us an account, I think you do give us an account of the kinds of experiences that ultimately result in these sedimentations, sedimented prejudices that then constitute experience in a certain way. If you give an account of how that cycle works, you should also be able to give an account of the kinds of experiences that would replace those or undermine those prejudices mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how maybe even say that if you have passive, if you are a passive racist on this account, maybe you're morally obligated to seek out the kinds of experiences that would undermine, mm -hmm. right? And there, that might be a really, really broad sense of all kinds of things you could do. It might be, you know, reading more critical race theory. That could be one of the experiences that can undermine these things. But yeah. it seems yeah. like you've got, you have the system there. If you have the system that puts the prejudices in there in the first place, it's the same system that replaces those prejudices. Yeah, at a very certain true. Point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Thank you. Um, another question here. I will just a footnote, Al Saji's work on hesitation mm -hmm. actually offers a, a positive account. We can talk about that, but anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. Th this was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I was sort of surprised that you went in a time consciousness direction, and I thought that that was really helpful. Um, because usually when people are talking about these sort of phenomenological roots of uh, racialized perception, they tend to go towards precisely the notion of the gaze or the white gaze as Yancey lays it out. And there's ultimately sort of Husserlian roots to that insofar as Yancey drawing this from Fanon, who's responding to Sartre, who ultimately, as I see it, is rereading Husserl's fifth Cartesian meditation in the look chapter of being nothingness. And I think the purchase that you get with using that kind of uh, scheme is that we get the notion that we initially experience others as objects, but then when the gaze is reversed, we then experience others as subjects. And so I think kind of tying back to Anthony's question, using that model of objectification can you get can get you something to something more prescriptive. Um, so I wonder if you might be able to tie that a little bit to the notion of time consciousness. Or are you really thinking this is kind of a separate move here, um, but one that's sort of interesting in its own right, whether or not it can get us to something prescriptive? I, I will just tell you right now, I get really worried when I start hearing the word prescriptive, right? Because there's a whole bunch of, of, of pitfalls that we have to watch out for. So we have the white savior, right? So the idea that I, as a white man, can write something about another white man that can then go and fix everything. I'm very hesitant on that talk, and I try to stay away from it as much as possible. Um, I do think that there can be a kind of prescriptive account that comes from this, but I think that would have to come from other resources. I'm already taking that racism is bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm already starting from that assumption. Um, 
And just furthermore, in terms of fixing things how they are in our country today, it's a billion, a billion problems from a billion different places all interacting with each other in different nexuses. Right? This is this, at least to me, I do believe that thinking about if I'm a white person, thinking about how my consciousness, to a sense, is racialized, is already going to start to help me think about getting out of it. But it's so hard to get out of something when it's everywhere. You know what I mean? Thanks. Here in the back. Uh, thank you. That, yeah, re really great paper. I, I think I want to, um, following up on some of those last two, I think I want to uh, give you more credit than you're giving yourself for what you can do with this, or maybe help draw out some implications, I think. Because um, I think there's two ways in which the kind of analysis you're doing here can prove uh, really helpful in, in, in these kinds of conversations. I think the first has to do with the sense of responsibility. Uh, and then the second has to do with sort of allure or the role that, that allure plays in, in the awakening process in passive synthesis. Um, so in terms of responsibility, I think one of the problems that, that, that you run into, that one runs into when you try to talk about this kind of passive racism with people who aren't already predisposed to agree with it, yeah. right? people you're trying to convince, mm -hmm. is right, this question of responsibility, right? Well, and, and they have a sort of a, a sense of responsibility. Well, I didn't choose it. If I didn't choose it, I'm not responsible, right? And, and then if you start to say, well, you have this, then it starts to say, like, you're choosing it, and then they get really defensive, right? Hence, hence the, your, your, your provisos at the beginning, right? Like, I'm not saying that, right? Um, and I think this gives you a way to talk about different levels of responsibility, right? And John Drummond talks about this in a few places, but different levels of responsibility that helps you say, look, I'm not saying you're purposely choosing to do this, so you don't have to be, like, I'm not calling you a... a a mm -hmm. horrible person. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, right now, you exist in a system that's structuring things this way, so you can't help but have this response, or you're you're predisposed towards having this response. And 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 now that I told you about it, you're kind of responsible for what you do with that, right? And so I think it helps bridge a gap. And so I think I think it's actually a really promising vocabulary for for furthering oppression theory and that kind of thing to say. Let's translate it into a more a neutralish vocabulary, so we can have a talk that maybe doesn't lets people you know, hear what you're saying without getting defensive right away. So I think that's one thing. Um, and the, the second one just... That's the hardest part of the whole thing. What's that? That's the hardest part of the whole thing. Yeah, and I think that's why I think it's really promising what you're doing. I find it really promising in that regard. Uh, and then the second thing in terms of rise or, or, or allure, right, the, the role that allure plays in the awakening process for Husserl and passive synthesis, uh, and that is... And this starts to get at the question of what do we do about it, but <laughs> it's... I, I, yeah, I don't have all the answers for that, but is, is something like, right, because when, uh, when something presents itself, of course, right, there's the question of what it's going to awaken in me. Does this awaken male body walking into the elevator? Does this awaken black body walk? Does this awaken stranger walking into the elevator? Right? I mean, there's all kinds of previous experiences I have sort of sedimented in my horizons. The question is, which of these is that going to pick up and, and spur and, and that kind of thing, right? Um, and so I think one... Uh, Part of what you can get with that, or, or part of, and I think more work needs to be done in, in this element of it, but, but yeah. I think there is work there in terms of towards being a positive something, right? Is, is how do we start to change people's responses, right? From like black equals delinquent, mm -hmm. right? And, and there's all, there's all kinds of ways, right? You, you can, and the one we focus on most is how do we change that equation between black and delinquent? Right? That, that, and that is one that we have to work on, right? But also, we can also you know, start to work on you know, other ways in which these things present themselves, right? So that it's not, how do I want to say this, right? That, that, that it doesn't awaken in me, let's say, fear of an unknown situation, that encountering strangers or people I don't know can awaken in me instead excitement about new opportunities, right? And, and we have plenty of experiences in our life too where we don't know something but we're excited about it, right? I get a present, I don't know what's in there but that's exciting to yeah. me, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's the same as I don't know a stranger, I don't know what that is, but one excites me and one gives me fear, right? And there has to be reasons, or, or I mean, reasons in a phenomenological sense, like what triggers up me in, one, in this direction or another direction, right? And, um, and so that's one thing, I don't, it's not an answer, but I'd like to hear what you think. And, and I think there's also in what you're talking about here too, there's a lot of, there's a, this is a, there's problems in this too, but there is a, certainly an, a, a, a defense to be made for something like affirmative action in what you're talking about here, in terms of the ways in which we can change our, our perceptions of bodies and of things. And I think there's something too that can be developed further from the work that you're doing, so. 
Any other questions? Uh oh. Um, hi, AJ. I, uh, hi, Lodi. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I have in my head the, the, the one line that you have, um, sort of uh, certain images in and then violence out. And um, the reason it's stuck in my head is um, there's a, a possible misinterpretation of, of what you're doing uh, in, in describing the passive racism as understanding it as determinist. Right, so that you know, I am fed with these images that creates now a racist, reactive person. There's nothing I can do, right? So the the, the possible, uh, well, I'm a white person, I'm racist. Eh, right? What am I going to do about it? Um, and uh, so I wanted to. Uh, cause some of the questions are, what do we do? We can. The the answer to that also, I think, comes in Husserl because Husserl is not a determinist, right? He's he's anything but, and these structures are meant to be open, right? Mm -hmm. And he repeatedly says, no matter what the content is that comes in, I can respond to it in different ways. Now, I think one of the points that you're making that's really important is that I can't always make choices about yes. the content that yes. comes in or how I react to it. Um, but the possibility that the structure might still allow for uh, different price types of responses might be a way for you to carry this to the, the next step, right? So, um, uh, so some stuff in, in uh, critical race theory talks about a rupture. You mentioned rupture or Yancey uses the word ambush. Um, but also, and I think this came up in some comments, uh, the notion of the future. If you're talking about temporal, um, the temporal structure, if we are necessarily also futural, then that is a side of us that's not determined. And so that might and be... And Yancey plays on that quite right. a bit. When he talks about wide awake dreamers, I think that's what he has in mind. Yeah, yeah that, seems, that seems right to me. Yeah. Sara? Uh, I was also very happy that you went to the kind of time time analysis by time, like sedimentation and habituation. And one reason is that I come from an area where uh, I don't know what the phenomenon on it, but it seems to be racism. But uh, the praise is not about blackness or color. It's more about you recognize a person uh, by his dialect mm -hmm. or language. Which means that you don't, you can't immediately, by perception, do this. You have to go into a kind of conversational, communicative mode, and then it comes in. But it, when it comes in, it comes equally, kind of uh, immediately, or you, you, the typification just kind of uh, is immediately triggered by when you hear the dialect. So I wonder about the kind of conceptual issue about the racism and how much race is really kind of. It's, it's kind of like useful to have this kind of gaze-based analysis of racism, but I think one also would need to have um, some alternatives where really color is not the issue, but the phenomenon is actually quite similar or, or almost the same. So I wonder, if do you know any kinds of who would do phenomenology of racism which is not about skin color? So, I mean, this also, if you look into the history of philosophy, and if you look at the history of British philosophers trying to grapple with this, like, you know, there was the one drop rule. Just one drop of black blood made you black, but this was terrifying for people because that meant that there could be black people that didn't look black, right? And so they ended up coming up in a Foucauldian sense. They ended up coming up with ways to fix all of that so that they weren't easily identified by the time. Um, so I don't know. I don't have enough experience with thinking about. But I would think that that would just fit into just sort of the structure of oppression in general. And then, yeah, but at the end of the day, it becomes. I think the danger is that one kind of, if one goes into this structure of, of oppression, uh, then one loses this kind of. 
then then you have sexism you have all so so it it becomes too broad kind of so it's hard to kind of and one thing I, you know I, at my school I teach I, I, I teach on race and teach on gender and sexuality I present to those those groups on campus and I don't know if this is what if this is a, if, sorry if this is not at all related to what you're asking but one thing that I tell them is I go look and I, I try to have meetings with like my LGBTQ my Black Student Union and like another all all at once and I'll give a talk. I'll say, look, all of the oppression that you suffer from is incommensurable with any other kind of oppression, right? So if you are a black man and you're, you're experiencing oppression through black, as a black man, that's going to be incommensurable with the suffering that a white woman undergoes qua white woman, right? So incommensurable, we can't compare them at all. But that said, the structure behind all of them are eerily similar. And you can talk, so we kind of talk about a logic of oppression that then spits out all of these incommensurable types of suffering in bunches of different groups. And from my readings over the last 10 years, it all looks pretty much the same. The structure, the way that it's a, it's a differential privilege. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question, but I just want to say over lunch, I went up to the May 4th Memorial and if you have not done that and you're new to this area, you should definitely do that, especially if you're from uh, that generation. It's quite moving, so I would just recommend that. But uh, my question has to do with the retention of retention. Is that an explicitly Husserlian uh, concept? Because I don't remember that. I remember retention and memory that he's talking about and uh, retention as an immediate awareness and consciousness of what has just passed. Dr. And then he, okay. The one who, I just, I just wondering what phenomenology, like, where are these retentions or retentions? Well, you end, up, I, you end I, up finding it in a number of places, and this is what Dr. Rodemeyer says in her book. Uh, you even find it in the first, of the first, but that main volume, Priscilliana volume on the phenomenology of internal time consciousness. There is a, there are a couple sections where he does say the retention of retention, but that never goes on to thematize with that language. Okay, thanks. I'll take a look at that. Any other questions? We still have a bit of time. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you. I enjoyed your paper very much. And I do have one question, though. We all have this general sense of racism being a huge systematic problem, something that engulfs us, or at least you here in the States. And as you were talking, I was reminded actually of something that doesn't really, isn't really directly connected. It's Derrida's text about Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, and about humanism and the discourse and the play in the humanist sciences. And he develops there this, he's interested in criticism of metaphysics, of trying to you know, get out of metaphysics or at least out of the bad, bad metaphysical stuff. And he develops this notion of bricolage of basically trying to fix a ship at open sea, plank by plank, basically. So I was wondering, I suppose the parallel to what you were saying would be that we might work on, and that we actually have the moral obligation to work on little everyday interactions with, for example, people of other skin colors. So I suppose my question would be, if a huge, top-down approach would be impossible. Do you think, for example, the lady from the elevator might work on her passive racism by trying to, you know, every day, just slightly changing her everyday interactions with people of other skin color or something like that? Would, would that at all be a helpful? I think it would be a drop in the bucket. Yeah. To be perfectly honest. Um, how I feel about this depends on what mood I wake up in, right? <laughs> So some days I wake up and I think to myself, shit, this is doable. So we're not going to fix this by the time I die, but hopefully I can do something to help get it fixed sometime in the future. Other days I wake up and I think of Plato and the Republic, where Plato says, how do you start the, the Republic? Well, you banish, kill, or banish all of the adults. <laughs> and you have to have a, a bottom-up, an entire restructuring so that what these kids see and what they understand on a daily basis aren't hit by all of this other stuff. If we're really gonna fix this, it has to be 
in the hearts and minds of everybody in our country, and we have to be willing to do it together at once. And that's the part that I have a hard time seeing ever happen. My name is Babakar, and I teach in the English department and also in the Department of Pan-African Studies here at Kent State. I really liked your presentation. Yeah, and I especially liked your reference to W.E.B. Du Bois, his concept of the double consciousness. And I was wondering if you would entertain the idea of uh, uh, including a reading of The Souls of Black Folk in your, yeah, in your paper. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, yes, exactly. And I'm thinking of uh, Du Bois's reference to the passing of his son, the passing of the firstborn, right? Burger. Yeah. In uh, 1899, the spring of 1899, uh, from diphtheria, right? Uh, yeah. Due to lack of uh, proper medical facilities, you know, Du Bois said that if he had, uh, his son had had uh, proper medical facilities, maybe he would have been alive. Uh, and that was uh, in 1903, yeah. he saw the black folk. So 2017, we still have the same, right? Uh, denial and uh, neglect of black bodies all over. So we have Ferguson, we have all these tensions. And then we have post-racialism, the debate, right? And we have like, oh, on every other day, you watch CNN, you hear somebody saying, race, 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 race. Why is it all about race? You see, so the problem here, an affirmative action, right? As you mentioned earlier, sir. Uh, and then you have, uh, I think at the end, you know, you have this flattening of human experiences, right? Uh, you have this neglect of race. You have, for instance, like uh, uh, this ongoing dismissal of race, not only from a local perspective, but also from a transnational oh, perspective. Yes. So critical race theory has a problem, right? But the other problem is, and, and you seem to be suggesting a solution. That's where I see a solution. You use, you use sound, right? You, you, you refer to sound, the importance of sound and the importance of time maybe as important notions that can be connected to Du Bois, uh, that allow us to connect Husserl to Du Bois. As you know, I mean, as folks, people of color, our students don't care about Husserl. They don't care about Hegel, right? And, and, and most white students don't know much about Du Bois. You know, so I see a potential in your work to connect those two. You know, to show us that, well, we can talk about the experience first, which is the first problem, recognizing the seriousness of the experience. So my question is, how can we talk about the significance of sound and time in Du Bois's work, specifically in The Souls of Black Folk, uh, in ways that suggest the, 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 I would say, the resonance, I mean, the, the importance of the experience? the racial experience that, that, that America is neglecting. Because I think before we can have responsibility, you know, uh, white acknowledgement of responsibility, first of all, we must have white acknowledgement of, of the, the experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. the experience. If, if, for instance, like you can talk about slavery today, you know, uh, or if slavery is only what it is represented to be, right? And if slavery is a done deal, you know, it's the thing of the past, then how can we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But thank you. I just wanted to say that I was really impressed. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to think about that, the Du Bois more. That was really good. I appreciate that. Any other questions? Final question. Sara. This is not a question, but it was triggered by the, uh, the discourse on slavery, because this is what, something what Beauvoir says in the second section. He says that sexism and racism in, in whatever form uh, differ due to the fact that uh, there is a kind of different historical yes. reference. Uh, and in the case of uh, racism for her, there is always a kind of period or a, or a kind of some event or, or kind of series of events in which the oppressed become oppressed. But then she argues that in, in the case of women, there is this kind of strange uh, continuation which has no kind of historical structure. So I wonder, um, is the concept of racism her concept? Would it be kind of too universalizing or too kind of generalizing? Because it, it seems that some 
cases have longer histories or not, 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 not as clear histories as others. So might it be that some cases of racism are nearer to sexism in her sense than others? Or? Well, you'll have to think about that. I, I just recently found out that um, a lot of her thinking about race, she's really good friends with Richard Wright. Yeah, well, she, she, was, she was influenced. Yeah, yeah. they hung out. Or not Richard Wright, I'm getting the dude's name wrong. I'm sorry, I, I, I dealt with two weeks of Hurricane Irma, so like, <laughs> isn't all that. Let me think of it, I'll tell you. She, they used to hang out all the time. And so I think the answer would lie somewhere in that interconnection. You'll have to think about that. We have time for one more question. Final thoughts? If not, I'll take it. Um, I've, um, I think going back to Anthony's question, actually, the first question. Um, are you familiar with Ali al Zaji's work? A little bit. She actually uh, performs a, an interesting sort of diagnostic, descriptive um, uh, sort of account of racism. She uses time consciousness, but she also uses embodiment, and she sort of um, explores this from multiple angles, but she ends up... So hesitation is her positive, mm -hmm. uh, prescriptive sort of uh, uh, hope. So she's a bit more maybe hopeful than you are. Yeah, I, I, I will just tell you right now. Yancey is one of my mentors. I've, a lot of my thinking is kind of determined by him. And that dude ain't hopeful a lot of the time. So it's, well, but just to, <laughs> sometimes just, he is. Yeah. It's just like me. It's just yeah. how you wake up. So the going back to time consciousness, one of the things that she points out is that the more habituated we become, and you, you, know, you point to retention, pretension, association, all that, typification, all of that gets embedded at a passive mm -hmm. level, and the more we do it, the more the more difficult it is for us to recognize that it's mm -hmm. happening and to do something about it. Um, and so there's a quickness and a swiftness to how those connections and associations happen, the more habituated we are. So her notion of hesitation has a critical sort of import, uh, and, and it's not something that happens overnight. She's very clear about the need for time, mm -hmm. for this happening over, the, over and over again over the course of time, where we would basically give ourselves the time to intervene and not allow those associations from happening as swiftly as, and one of the ways we could do it is simply by locating ourselves in an embodied sense in a different kind of environment. So go to spaces that we might not frequent, uh, sit in a, in a different location and sit in a different way. Uh, so even just in the most basic and aesthetic sense of negotiating lived spatial possibilities, we could begin to gradually sort of do that kind of work and it's, it's painful and it's slow and, and it's deeply impossible. personal. Right? Sometimes impossible. And sometimes impossible, but she thinks that in time there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a good chance that something critical Will will happen through this through this work of a uh, positive work of hesitation. Yeah. I, I'll have to read that. Shannon Sullivan takes what sounds to me like a similar tact. She does. Yeah. And I have a massive problem with that. And it's this: like, okay, so so one of her thing, one of the things that Shannon Sullivan argues is, okay, <laughs> well, if you want to undo your racism, just go plop yourself down in a different place. And that sounds fine. But if if now my idea of doing that is plopping myself down on the corner on the corner of Crenshaw. In south in southeastern LA, like that's just not going to fly because that community did not invite me in. It's part of it's part of this whiteness that I have that just thinks, oh, I could just be here right now. It doesn't matter, you know what I mean? And so I I, I dig the suggestion, but I get hesitant yeah. about things like that. It she, seems she, yeah. very easy. She, no, she would say it's difficult, partial, incomplete, and okay, hopeful at best. So that, that this is not the solution. This is just. Can we start anywhere yeah. and do anything? And I think this, it's a necessary. Point. This is just her, yeah. Any other final questions? All right, so let's thank our speaker.